Not a big fan of John Deere. Well, I can't complain. This old girl's moved hundreds of yards of dirt, trenched in power lines, water lines, and a few other things for me. But uh, there's a few things that John Deere probably should have taken into consideration when they built these things, and I certainly hope they've learned from the error of their ways. So, welcome back. Yeah, it's been a while since you heard from me, but uh, most of that's because of this old girl right here. She's been down for a while, and uh, just got the injection pump put back on. So, we're ready to fire up and roll again. Let me show you a few things I learned along the way. Okay, John Deere used two different model injection pumps on these engines. And one of which was the Rusa Master, which is what you're looking at right here. The Standardine looks really, really similar. There's only different in a couple aspects. Later, Standardine bought out Rusa Master and started producing the same pump. It's a JDB, otherwise known as some similar to a DB2 in the Standardine world. So, if you've ever had a 6.2 diesel from a GM, you're pretty much looking at a really similar injection pump. Four cylinder, being that you got the four little injector lines right here. <clears throat> but the biggest headache with this injection pump is the mounting bolts right here and then right down there. This engine's got two uh, balancer shafts and it's also got a big boss on the side of the block right here. So to get to this other nut back in here, you pretty much have to cannibalize a wrench to get in there. 9 16 is what the nuts are distributor wrench might help but like I said this bottom one down here you're pretty much going to be taking a 9 16 wrench be moving this in a 90 degree angle one direction and moving the open end in a 90 degree the other direction not fun I hated to do it to a wrench no I did not do it to a snap-on wrench the uh, actually one of my old crafts from a 9 16 was the uh, victim it actually bit into the nuts a whole lot better so there, like I said, is one of the headache. Real quick, there's the annihilation of the wrench right there. Yeah, see if I can do this without blocking the camera out. When you get this in here, the other thing is the neck of the shaft right here tapers up too fast, and you won't be able to get an actual box end wrench in there, which is what you want to get in but it's not going to help you any. There we go. I'll move the camera in here closer and let you see what I'm up against here. So there you go. And in the down position, when you're trying to grab it, an ordinary wrench will be contacting the frame rail right there. So, like I said, I hated to, but that's what I ended up with. So, sorry there, Craftsman Ranch. You've been a good ranch, but now you're going to serve a different purpose. These injector lines through here. There's one on the exact opposite side of this one here. So, way back in here. You don't have enough room to get the bolt put into the actual hole while keeping the steel washers on. I actually had to lay a... Uh, rag down in here to catch everything. I ended up fishing the entire bolt and two washer assemblies and all out of the pan down below here twice. What I've done, and I covered this in an earlier video, is I swapped out with this one here and went into a AN line and uh, that really cleaned up my fuel system a lot. So I ran it over to a spin-on filter that mounted to the intake. Now, another problem I've got with this is up on top. Let me take you up there and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, I've been bashing deer for a couple of minutes here. Besides their cockpits, they're always really too small, and I'm only five foot seven. Um, that seems to be a trend I've found in both their farm equipment and their uh, construction equipment. Right all the way up to the 950K deer that I was running a while back here for a construction outfit, the cockpits are just really small. So, all right, one good thing I found here. This cowl, which is huge and heavy, actually tips away. So, if you get one of these older deers, you drop these three bolts out right along here, and this whole cowl assembly will tilt forward. It makes it a lot easier to get into the water pump. 
And if you're going to set the timing on one of these, which is what you're going to have to do with the new injection pump, this back here is actually your timing key. If you undo this bolt, this little paddle, this plunger comes, comes off, this rod inserts into the hole that this thing unscrew, this screws into. You'll rotate the engine over by hand, and what you're watching for is your uh, number one cylinder. Both valves will be on the compression stroke. In other words, both be up. Insert your keyway, get it in there, and there ought to be a hole in the flywheel that you slide it into. At which point in time, what they want you to do is put a pipe wrench on the actual crankshaft extension. That's a big extension that bolts into your crankshaft and goes up to your hydraulic pump up front. You get a pipe wrench on there and you're going to be turning that thing counterclockwise according to the view of the flywheel. So if you're looking at it, looking at the flywheel, picture yourself looking from the seat of the operator on the flywheel. You're going to be turning counterclockwise so the whole thing's going to be rotating to the left side of the engine, or left side of the machine. Uh, most of the places that I've talked to, they want about 1200 bucks, anywhere from 900 to 1200 bucks to do this injection pump. I uh, found a company in Memphis, Tennessee called Diesel Care and Performance, DCP. They're on the internet, guys. Look them up. Uh, they cranked this thing out in about three weeks, and I sent my original down to them. My original was a Rusa Master. Sent it down to them. They cranked it out, and I got it put back on. It's taken me two days to get it put back on. Because I did not set my engine to top dead center when I pulled it off. I was in a hurry. Um, I only had a couple hours and I had to be in a truck heading for the Cameron Peak Fire in Fort Collins, Colorado. So I yanked this sucker off as fast as I possibly could. Got it in a box, handed it to my wife and ran out the door. Yeah, I scratched the dog and hugged the wife on the way out the door. So don't worry about that one. Anyhow, these guys cranked this thing out and I got it back in here. And then I spent probably half a day trying to make a barring tool to turn my engine over without having to drop this cowl. I finally ended up dropping the cowl and rotating it over my hand with a pipe wrench. So again, and then these injection lines fought me getting it back in here. And what you're looking for when you set one of these back in, you're going to find your throttle shaft has been wired. It's been wired in the back position. They do that so nothing shakes on the way home. And then you'll be removing this little window on the side. You're going to find two lines in there. One line will be on the right side it's separating. It's two halves of a balancer moving, basically, in a shaft. Find another line. Those two need to be in line with each other. So make sure your engine is at top dead center and the shaft is going to be sticking out. For me, my shaft was sitting, there's a little cut, like keyway on the end of the shaft, and it was facing up. There's a female side of that in this pump, and when I looked inside it, it was kind of at the one o'clock position. Thankfully, there's enough little room on these adjustment nuts here. And I slid it in, kind of rotated it to the right and to the left according to the book because there's a seal that sets in the shaft. You rotate it to get that seal setting right and then those lines came into, came into being the same. That's when you know you bolt it down. So, finished bolting her up, finished hooking it all back together and then away we go. Took me a little while to prime it because honestly I forgot to put the wire back on. So, duh on me. And once I had the wire back on, she primed up and fired off. So there you go. Quick little run on the uh, JD450, 1980 JD450C crawler loader backhoe. Okay, the turbo drain back tube goes into the valve cover. I wait for the wind to stop blowing here for a second. <laughs> it just increases. Welcome to Wyoming. With the turbo draining back into the valve cover here, that's fine and dandy. But this breather tube goes out the back of the engine, drops down, and goes down into the belly pan. That's fine, but let's have a disconnect here. The way this guy here comes apart is you literally have to take a bolt back here at the back of the valve cover apart, pull up on it, and drive it out of its socket here. Rubber hammer, etc., whatever. This turbo pipe comes off fairly relatively easy. Just undoing the two slip joints here and hopefully you don't tear them. Now, that being said, there's a lip all the way around the valve cover. If anybody's worked machinery for their lifetime, lips and valve covers don't work. They collect dirt. If, you, if you're out busted down in the field, which is usually where these things break down at, 
you may or may not be able to get all the dirt off of it. So as soon as you undo the bolts around the valve cover, that lip turns loose and dumps all the oil or all the dirt down inside your uh, valve galley. Yeah, nice, fun times. Here's another issue right here. That is your injector nut. Great big old three quarter inch nut. Underneath it is another slip line, which is 9 16 So you gotta get two wrenches in there to start working on that injector nut for bleeding your fuel system. The other thing is they ran the return right over top of it, so you can't get to the injector nut without disrupting the return line. Uh, brilliant, guys. Looks like there's a lot of room through here, but there's actually not. So when you're working with a three-quarter inch wrench on that big nut, and then you're trying to bring a, a 9 16 in underneath it, uh, things get complicated in a hurry. Now, let's go back here to the back side, and I'll show you one more little hot spot. All right. Here's that breather tube I was talking about a second ago. It bolts in right back here on a pedestal with a big washer, and that bolts into the actual valve cover. There ain't a whole lot of room back here for trying to monkey one of these one direction or the other. So just be prepared when you get in here. The valve cover bolts are 7 16 So just to give you a little heads up when you get into this puppy. A little plug for a good modification. This is that fuel filter I was referring to earlier on. I think I covered it in an earlier video. Um, this is a BF1212 or a Fleet Guard FS1212 filter. This is your actual lift pump over here. The lift pump is actuated by a paddle plunger on the side. You can paddle plunger and get the uh, get the fuel flowing. So they're actually uh, they're about 60 bucks if you try to buy one through Napa. So they are still made. They don't usually go out. I've got a brand new one that I thought was my initial problem, but it's actually not. It turned out being the injection pump. So <clears throat> this filter assembly up here has made life a lot easier. Uh, I ran this AN, three, uh, 6AN, 3 8 line all the way back to the fuel tank and put a ball valve, shut off valve back there. So if you haven't done this to your old loader, it's really worth your time and effort. It made priming the system a whole lot easier because I had clean fuel and free flowing fuel all the way up to the injection pump. So the old Motorola alternator's been swapped out with a Delco. And it's a one wire Delco, so that also increased my charging a lot. It's helped this old machine out, and then of course I got that 28 MT starter in there uh, that Dakota Battery and Electric hooked me up with. So overall, those are some modifications that you can do to yours to make life a little easier for you. Cold starting in the winter time. I think we covered it in another video, or one of my first videos actually. This line here goes back to that little port on my dashboard that I plugged the ether cans into. One thing would really help these engines a lot, and they may have actually had a glow plug in these things originally early on. Glow plugs, in my opinion, are about plumb worthless. Um, really need to modify in like a Cummins grid heater into this intake manifold here. That would really be worth its salt, and that would probably make this old girl pop off a lot better in the wintertime. <laughs>